are we here today, Colin? Why are we here? Colin, you're not super relatable to me. Does that mean that my grammar is correct? No. I'm a professional journalist and I don't know these things, which I think is a bit of a problem. <laughs> I've talked about this in terms of the power of guilt. Uh, which is very appropriate if you're doing something in a Jewish language. <laughs> We have uh, an interview coming up with uh, the absolutely astounding language learner. She's going to kill me for saying this. I can sort of see on the other camera the, the change in expression. Um, Natasha Lippman. We are talking about input-based methods in language learning and, and how, just how they work in practice. So we're going to talk a little bit about Natasha's story and then try to weave in some tips and things that you can use in your own language learning journeys. Um, I don't think we need too much more introduction, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do some, some real technical wizardry here, and I'm going to switch this over, and we're going to talk to Natasha. Um, however, I've been told by my producer to begin all the segments like this. If you're just joining us on YouTube now, thank you so much. Uh, this is a channel all about language, whether it's linguistics, whether it's constructed languages, or whether it's language learning, as we're going to be talking about today. So if you like this kind of thing, please do consider uh, giving the video a like, subscribing to the channel, and you know what comes next, the whole bell thing. Um, so if you're into that, please do. Um, but without further ado, let's switch over and talk to Natasha Lippman. So... Hello! Hello, Natasha. You caught me mid about to Instagram this. Oh, I oh, put my phone down. I, should, I, shouldn't, I shouldn't interrupt <laughs> these kinds of things. This is the publicity. So welcome. Welcome aboard the uh, our inaugural interview live stream. Thank you for having me. This is my first YouTube live stream. Well, well it's my, I think, fifth. So you're not too far <laughs> behind the curve in terms of... Um, in terms of experience on this kind of thing. But that's not the experience that we want to talk about today. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about your experience learning a language uh, using input-based methods. Um, so maybe, could you do a little bit of your, your spiel? You know, who are you? What's your interest in language learning? What language are you learning? All this sort of thing. Uh, I'm Natasha Lippmann. I am a journalist for the BBC and I am a chronic illness and disability blogger and host of the Restroom podcast. I started learning Yiddish with you this year and um, it has been a very interesting experience and I consider myself as my little uh, thing there says uh, I am a, a novice language learner. I learned French in school and got an A at GCSE, but then moved to France and realized I could not speak French. I um, I could barely ask where the loo was. I could say where I went on holiday and that was about it. I didn't know that, well, maybe this was just me being simple, but bonjour. <laughs> I didn't make like the distinction between the different ways of saying like good day, good more, uh, good day, good evening, good night. Um, and I, over the years, have kind of tried to learn languages again. Um, when I was in France, I did learn French pretty well um, because I was living there. I had a really good immersion. Um, my fiance is German and I thought I should probably learn German and every time I started I failed um, because I didn't really want to learn German which is why it's quite funny now that I'm learning Yiddish. So I want to ask one question and this is probably just to help the international um, listeners and viewers. Uh, you say GCSE French. What does that entail in terms of how many years of study? I started French when I was probably nine or ten. Um, and I did my GCSEs when I was 16. Um, so we can say maybe six years of French in school, multiple times a week, um, very much textbook based, very much predominantly English as the instruction language. And yeah, it's really depressing when you think about how much time you actually spent in a classroom learning a language and not really picking anything up. It always astounds me, you know, is this, is this something that we would accept in, in other sort of fields of study, in other uh, school subjects? You do something for 
six to seven years. And at the end, you are considered by the educational system to have succeeded. And yet that success seems to have nothing to do with success in the actual thing that you're supposed to have learned. And this to me seems bizarre. Maybe, maybe it's not just languages, but I think um, for languages, it really comes out and it's very striking. This disconnect between what officially we do, you know, we pass these classes, but then we don't speak the language. And I just remembered that, oh, sorry. No, I was just about to say, and I find it astounding. It is astounding. And I, I remember actually, I don't remember if I learned Latin before I learned French, um, but I did do a few years of Latin and the way it was taught was very, here are words you need to memorize, here are sentences you need to memorize, here are some grammar tables that you need to memorize. And I feel like that method of instruction very much carried over through all languages that I did at school. Like I did a few terms of some other languages, um, but it was very much not, it didn't seem to be about how do you learn a language? It was how can you remember these things in the textbook that you need to remember in order to pass an exam? And I never felt like I was learning French to speak the language. And I think there are people that do very, very well at school when they learn a language. They, um, they might have a particular interest in the language and they, um, they do a lot outside of school for it. But for me at that time, language learning at school was very much, this is just another subject. I'm not actually aiming to be able to speak the language by the end of it, um, which I think is a bit of a problem <laughs> when it comes to motivation. Yeah, was uh, was French mandatory for you? Yes. In school? So it's the same yeah. here in Canada. And I think the record of success is, is quite, or at least in English speaking Canada, um, I think the record of success is quite similar. Um, to what you're talking about, you know, every one of us goes through, I'm thinking, you know, at least five years of French, you know, I'm talking about in Ontario, it might be different in different places, different school systems, but there's a substantial amount of French instruction. And if you go across Canada in the English speaking regions, you're not likely to find a lot of people who can speak French. Um, and it's sort of a joke that we tell each other, you know, I did so ever many years of French in school, and I can read the back of a cereal box um, and that's what it ends up amounting to and I think it's a real shame um, so many hours of our lives are spent doing this and it amounts to nothing and I I think that that is that's a big disconnect and that's something that I would like to I'd like to help change because I think a lot of people just assume that we've you know whatever is going on in the institutions is the way that's been figured out to do this best and if you fail at it well that's your fault as an individual learner it's also quite funny, um, at my language school in Paris, I think I was maybe the second English student they'd ever had. And they were so surprised that someone from England was coming to learn another language. <laughs> and I think that is the other thing that when you are a native English speaker, you kind of luck out <laughs> because no matter where you go in the world, um, there will probably be people that understand you. And so there's an inherent laziness that can come with that. Um, if you're in a group of international students, everyone will be speaking English. Um, and there's, it, it's also quite funny because I remember being on the metro and there were these American girls are talking very rudely about someone else on the metro in English. And I think I was speaking on the phone in French at the time and I like switched to English and I said, it's really funny when people think that people don't speak English in other countries <laughs> and just their faces. <laughs> <laughs> it was so it was so funny um but I think it does speak to like that shock is always quite sad but also quite funny <laughs> there, there's like oh why are you choosing to come and learn a language um which I suppose is quite a good place to start right like why yeah why are we here today Colin? why are we here what what and so when we're learning languages this is one big difference that I think um one big difference between first and second language acquisition, which is the context in which it occurs. When we are learning, when we're acquiring our first language, um, we're in a position where this language is a necessity for us to be able to get our basic needs met as we get older and want to, or are essentially forced to participate in, in some form of society, right? Um, we, need, we need language to do so. And this is not really the case usually when we are... Um, 
when we're going after second languages, second, third, fourth, you know, we'll call them all, we'll call them all second um, for our purposes here. The necessity is not always there, especially as you point out as an English speaker, there is usually a way around having to learn another language. You don't need it to survive, generally. Um, obviously some exceptions to that, but this, this fact actually may account for a huge amount of the discrepancy in, in outcomes between first and second language acquisition, because you're not really comparing apples to apples. You're comparing something that's a vital need to something that's, you know, a nice to have in a lot of cases. So I think when we approach the questions of motivation in, in learning second languages, I think we, if we can try and approach a situation where it seems like a necessity, even though it's not truly a necessity for us, but if we can almost trick ourselves into thinking it is a necessity, then we may do a lot better. And, and in my experience, I've done a lot better and, and people I've seen apply this approach have done a lot better. Um, one way to do that is to use this fuel of, of interest. When you're interested in something, it almost feels like a need, you know, to learn more about it. And if you don't have that interest, if you're sitting in a classroom because you have to be there, that's perhaps one big reason why you're not going to advance much. Um, but in terms of, to bring it more concretely, what is, what's the why for you? Why are you, so you're learning Yiddish now. What brought that on? What's, what's the inciting incident? What's the motivating factor? My grandma. Um, I always wanted to learn Yiddish. It's my grandma's first language, or at least like her co-first language, I suppose. She grew up in the UK um, and she spoke what I call Cockney, uh, Cockney Yiddish. She's, she definitely spoke it with a Cockney accent. Um, and I always liked hearing it from her and I always wanted to learn it. And I would always say, Grandma, will you teach me Yiddish? And she would say, oh, gay cuck and yuff and yum, which means go do something in the sea. <laughs> um, and I, yeah, I, I just, I always wanted to learn it and I never really knew how to go about that. And then I don't even remember why we decided to do it. I, I don't even know if I saw something online or I thought, oh, okay, maybe there'll be more things on the internet about it. I actually do not remember. Do you remember like, the inciting incident? I just know that I always wanted to learn it. So I want to make very clear for hipster purposes that this all preceded the <laughs> Duolingo Yiddish. Um, yes. The Duolingo Yiddish course. So it wasn't that um, because this all started. And, I, you know, for, for our viewers, I'm asking this sort of as an interviewer, but I was a participant in this, this whole thing as well. Um, <laughs> But uh, I remember that we, we started our classes in early uh, January 2021. And so before that, in the winter, maybe late fall of 2020, that's when we started, I think, joking at, jokingly at first, oh, yeah, we should totally learn Yiddish. And then it became more and more, uh, more and more serious as, as time went on. But I think you really took the lead on that. I was sort of like, oh, you know, that would be kind of cool. Um, I have a real problem. I was seeing with learning languages in the sense that I just see, you know, my eyes are bigger than my stomach. I always try and learn too many at a time. Um, but, but you really took the lead on that. You went on and found some courses. Yeah. So I started off um, and I'm learning with my fiance. Um, we did a two week alphabet course. Um, and then we were trying to find the right way to continue learning. And we started doing a course and I wasn't very well at the time. And also just the way it was set up was kind of very much a traditional kind of schooly way of learning a language. Um, I almost felt vindicated um, with that because Sebastian um, had only ever learned languages in Germany. Um, and he said it felt very different to that. I was like, this is how we learn languages in the English speaking world. And, um, it just didn't really work. So I tried to find as a private tutor, but I think it's interesting with Yiddish because we're not really going to go anywhere and speak Yiddish. It's not like I'm planning to go to a country and speak Yiddish. My grandma's not here anymore, so I can't speak to her in Yiddish. I don't know what it was, but there was just something, maybe the time was right. Um, you know, lockdowns and internet and, I don't even know. I just, we, we managed to find an amazing teacher and 
I think I'm very lucky that I fell in love with Yiddish as I started learning it. Like even within the first few months, I felt that I understood more about my family and I understood the way people I know communicated and I loved it. <laughs> and I'd never really had that with a language before. So with French, I actually started taking it seriously when I wanted to live in France. And then when I realized that wasn't going to happen, my interest kind of waned. Um, and then with every other language that I kind of picked up, it lasted like a very, very short amount of time. And I think Yiddish has been the first time I've actually stuck with a language, but I think that it helps that I've been learning with other people and we can be excited about it together. This is such a huge thing. And I've, I've talked about this in terms of the power of guilt. I mean, that's one way of, of talking about Which it. Which is very appropriate if you're doing something in a Jewish language. <laughs> <laughs> um, no comment. Um, but I, I can say that as well. You, you can say that. <laughs> um, but it's, it's really something when you wake up and, you know, maybe you're not feeling super excited about the language. Maybe you had a rough... Um, a rough time in a conversation, you know, you couldn't find the words, you're feeling sort of bad about how, how things are going. But you know, the next morning you have something scheduled with some friends of yours, and if you don't show up, they're going to be left in the lurch. And, you know, that's productive guilt, I think, because that gets you back. And then you get there and you have a better time, uh, and and then you keep going. Um, you, you've, you've, I find interest, at least for me, and I think for a lot of people, interest waxes and wanes in everything. You know, there's so many things out there. If you're an easily distractible person like I am, you know, you see something shiny, you go, oh, no, yeah, maybe I'll learn. Maybe I'll pick up some Sanskrit this week. And it takes some discipline to say no. Um, but I find it doesn't take much discipline to try to be a good friend to people. You know, maybe I'm patting myself on, a, on the back for that. But I, I think it, it does come naturally, more naturally than um, making a commitment to some sort of abstract book you know, abstract idea of, of I should be doing this because I'm trying to advance in this book and then I'll be able to read this thing later on. No, these are real people that you have a relationship with. And so I find it really helpful to, to not um, not want to let them down. But then there's also the positive side, which is it's just fun. It's fun to do it with other people. So you get to compare notes. You can, you can speak to each other in the language eventually. Um, we have recently reached this milestone now in Yiddish where we can have our conversations in Yiddish. You when know. we had our um our little meeting about doing this live stream, we switched to English kind of halfway through the conversation and both of us were like, this is really weird to this speak to you in English, even though English, no. we've been speaking together in English for maybe eight years. I think it's really weird how even just over a process of a few months, um that has changed. But I think I think the other thing as well is not just motivation and interest, it's also life gets in the way, which I'm sure we will talk about that a bit later, but it's it's all kind of tied up in this big bow um, that makes me think a lot about before we even started, because I literally, after my first alphabet class, I called you crying. I remember this. Uh, this, this is tough. And I find, you know... I find the issues with the alphabet to be, they've been plaguing me over the past year. I've found my my reading, um, my Yiddish reading to be uh, the slowest advancing of all the skills. And that's um, to, a some, to some extent natural, a natural occurrence. Oh, I mean, that's not even talking about writing, um, handwriting at least. Um, but, but there's a, a kind of truth, which, which is that the just, in some ways, the more you do it, the better you will get. And you have to actually sort of expect that that fluctuation. You expect bad days. And one of the things that I find really, really, really uh, helpful about this, not so much in terms of writing, but in terms of things like grammar, is that when you have a bad day, you're, you're, viewing, you're viewing almost... You're viewing the sort of the state of your internal representation of the language. So, you know, say you come to a, a conversation class or something, you're tired, you're distracted, you're stressed. And there are some things that, you know, you'd normally be able to do and you just can't do. You can't remember this word. You, you know, you, you misconjugate this verb. You're actually now seeing 
the state of your representation, your mental representation of that language. Because think of it this way. In, in your first language, so our, both of our first languages are English, so we'll use that as an example. Um, are you ever tempted to say, I halved, I halved a bad day? It's just not something that even if you're really tired, you're not going to say. And that's because that's your representation of English. You, that sort of form, halved, that ungrammatical form, uh, is just not going to come out because it's not part of your representation of English. Whereas uh, when you are, you know, well rested, when you're, you know, in a good mood and you're able to focus, um, you may actually be able to rely on more conscious as uh, aspects of knowledge about the language. Those will come to you faster and then you can sort of, you know, polish things up a little bit before you say them. And so I find this actually quite, um, quite positive because when I'm having a bad day, I actually know where my representation, what level of development it's at. It's, it's kind of cool because invariably it will be at a better level than it was a month ago or two months ago or six months ago. Um, I actually noticed this yesterday. I was in a, a Zoom event and we were put on the spot to introduce ourselves after this big talk. This was in Yiddish? In Yiddish. Um, and I made some mistakes because I was tired and not expecting to have to say anything. And I'd followed along the whole thing. I could understand, but I wasn't planning on speaking. And then afterwards I was like, ah, oh, I said that wrong. I said that one wrong. That's a bad representation of my Yiddish. But actually, yeah, because I was not consciously correcting myself as I went along. Um, but I think, would it be helpful to have a conversation about like that process of learning about input? Because we we talked about how um, <laughs> how I thought you had to learn languages <laughs> by memorizing certain facts, um, and you were the one that kind of taught me that that's not necessarily the case, um, and how we kind of started approaching that when it came to Yiddish specifically. Yes. So this is a big distinction that I think some people are entirely unaware of. And it's one of these things that when you learn it, it makes a huge difference in how you approach um, language learning, which is that learning facts about a language, these are things like the grammatical rules that you read about in textbooks, um, things like the third person plural, the imperfect form ends with this. If it's I don't even know what that is in English. <laughs> well, that's it. You don't. I'm a professional journalist, and I don't know these things. It makes my editor mad. <laughs> but you're you are a native speaker of English, and you don't know yeah. these things. So how can they be a necessity for being becoming a native like in English? That you know, if if native speakers don't generally have them. Um, okay, so that's one thing. Those are separate from whatever is going on in your mind that is making you able to speak and comprehend English. The other thing is, there are rules that govern how English operates. And these rules that we see in textbooks are attempts to kind of um, approach them. But these rules are actually extremely complex and abstract. And, you know, if you saw um, the kinds of analyses that linguists do to try and account for what how a language actually operates you'd you know you'd, you'd throw the book across the room you, you gigantic trees with strange names that you know have bear no resemblance to anything you've ever heard of um you know I, the example i always like to give is there's a thing called pro there's actually a big pro and a little pro and these things have huge roles in some theories at least of how of how language works you're never going to learn about that in a, in a class and yet, if you if you speak English, if you're a native English speaker, you know all the rules unconsciously. And so something happens between the moment of your birth and now uh, in which you acquired all of those rules without being able to articulate them at all. Even, you know, you have to go through advanced studies in linguistics before you can start to articulate them. And linguists even debate, you know, the, the precise way that we should articulate them best to account for the data. And yet, here we are walking around, talking to each other, using these rules without breaking a sweat. Well, so, one of the things that 
Um, sorry, I think we have a slight lag, so I apologize for talking with you. Oh, no um, worries. <laughs> one of the things where that's really, really noticeable is when you go to a traditional language class, a traditional second language class, because often in the first or second lesson, you're told how to say hello and goodbye in a bunch of different ways, and they're all explained to you in English. You might be able to say my name is. And then you have the grammar tables of how to say to be and to have, and you go over them over and over again in English. And that is how you are introduced to a language. You are introduced to it in a way that very much is trying to force a structure in your brain. And I would go over these over and over and over again, and I would not know why they would not stick. I could not seem to conjugate them. <laughs> I could not see, I was like, I'm never going to be able to conjugate anything. Um, and it's quite demoralizing when you're just trying to force pieces of information into your brain when your brain doesn't take well to forceful information. <laughs> um, and I think, especially at the beginning, because I was coming into this without an understanding of how to learn a language, I started making flashcards for things. And I started just kind of repeating things over and over again, and nothing was going in. And if that's happening in your first month or two, when in theory, you're supposed to be the most um, motivated and most excited, and this was before we started working with our teacher. Um, this was between my alphabet course and I was I was already feeling demoralized I was already feeling frustrated um or you know I would read some dialogues with somebody but not really understand what they were and it it was very frustrating so my inherent motivation had gone down I kept seeing all these grammatical terms that I didn't understand. Um, even like really basic grammatical terms, I see them and like my heart starts beating faster and I start sweating a bit and I get really stressed and my brain is just like, you're not going to understand this. So you're a grammar phone, so, essentially. Yeah, like admittedly, I have like a visceral reaction to seeing grammatical terms in a textbook. Um, and I think that automatically then puts me on the defensive that I think in my head, I'm not going to be able to learn this. Um, and it was only through, it was almost like I was having language therapy with you, <laughs> um, that we started to kind of unpick that. So I know that we're going to be talking about the bigger concepts later, but if we're talking about from a really practical level, that distinction between school learning um, and force feeding your brain all of these nutrient dense but fiber I, I don't know I was trying to go for something <laughs> one. Um, but trying to force your brain to remember something um, what are kind of the first steps of getting out of that so I think the the first step is to look at a distinction that has come up in the literature which is a distinction between uh, learning and acquisition and in the context of of language learning is learning these sort of facts about language so you're learning the ways to conjugate this particular verb you're learning the endings of a, you know the definite article you know the date of case and all this kind of thing um, do not say date if I, <laughs> <laughs> I apologize for the date of reference um so that that's learning and and it's not valueless these are facts about language at a certain level of abstraction. And if you like languages, like I'm sure many of our, our listeners are people who find language intrinsically interesting. Um, I am a person who finds language intrinsically interesting. Not everyone is a person who finds language intrinsically interesting for some reason. No, no, no judgment. Um, so you may not be, have any interest to learn those facts. Let's contrast that with acquisition. This is something that happens sort of while you're trying to decode messages that come to you. Things are being communicated to you by other people, whether these people are people in your life, whether they're figures on TV, podcast hosts, YouTube people, um, newspaper authors, things like this. People are trying to com uh, communicate message to messages to you using a language. And you are interested in what these messages mean 
you you want to you want this meaning to be transmitted to you what happens while you're doing that while you're working that out um is your representation, your mental representation of the language starts to develop and it starts to go through particular sort of predictable stages um, over time. And this process of building up this mental representation guided by or fed by the input in the environment around you, this is the language that you're trying to work out the messages of, um, this is acquisition, this process. And it's much more like growing a plant than like than like learning a, a skill that you would um, you know repeat to get better at. What you need to do is just keep watering that plant with input, input being all the language that is coming at you that you want to understand the messages of and and let time do its magic. Your, your, your mind is in some ways built for this um, and people, argue and they throw chairs at each other at conferences over the precise details of how your mind is built for this. But it does seem to be the case that humans are just good at learning languages. Uh, when we're placed in the in a linguistic environment, it happens. You know, we all know the stories of someone who, um, a family who immigrates to a, a country where a different language is spoken. Um, the parents may not ever, uh, may not ever reach a high level in that language. The children native speakers, if they come at a young enough age. Um, and so something's going on there. You know, there's something that underlies that ability. And what we want to do as second language learners is try to get access to it. One of the things that I found really, really interesting, I think it was kind of over the first couple of months, we were working with a new teacher and we were kind of figuring out how we would learn together um, with the resources that he had, what we wanted to learn. And I think what made our learning situation quite interesting was I was learning Yiddish, which has a very heavy German component to it with a native German speaker and a linguist who knows a lot of German or a good amount of German um, and a lot of other languages. So I was the only one that was really going in. My knowledge was basically how to say bottom and the odd you know, inappropriate thing that I'd learned from my grandma. Um, and that was it. And we were all learning together, which meant that we were on a different level um, together, which made it difficult maybe for each of us in different ways, because I don't know if it was a bit boring for Sebastian um, or I, I, not necessarily not boring because he, he really enjoyed it. But I suppose if he was learning by himself, it would have been a very different approach to the language than if he was learning with me. Um, and he is just sneakily walking past after uh, doing something with some bread in the kitchen so we can allow it. Um, and um, it, yeah, it was it was very interesting at the beginning because we kind of were very quickly every week we were changing what we were doing as Gustavo was getting to know us and what we were interested in. I was complaining about grammar a lot. Um, we were, we, we very quickly got to a point where we were predominantly just talking yeah, and very using quickly. very, very quickly. quickly. Um, even when I could barely say broken sentences, it was very much um, a, yeah, we, we kind of moved away from the initial book that we were going to use that had a lot of phrases in. And um, that was when things really picked up when we just started talking to each other. Um, and looking back at the early videos, which is really nice, actually, because we've got recordings and we can see the progress that we've made. Um, it's It was when we started kind of having a somewhat level appropriate content that we could look at and explore together or we would have conversations about what was going on in our lives or topics that we were interested in. And then, you know, after a few months it was just kind of growing more and more and more and we were able to engage with more content um, and that was really exciting. It's something magical when you can finally talk about things that you are actually interested in in the language. And this actually can happen a lot earlier than you think um, or than you might think. For example, you may be at a, a stage where you're not comfortable producing full sentences. Well, you can still comprehend. You, your, your comprehension is going to be at a higher level than your production basically always. So 
So your your conversation partner, your teacher, um, can knowing your level start to approach approach things that you want to talk about. Maybe use some code switching. So go back and forth between the language, the target language, and and then your um, first language. Or there are all sorts of techniques. Um, you know, speaking slowly, emphasizing. Um, Speaking slowly, emphasizing a certain sort of intonation pattern. Um, think of how um, parents speak to their children. This is these are ways of making the input more comprehensible. So slowing it down. Um, if it's clear that the person doesn't understand something, you can rephrase. Um, you can, you know, give synonyms. Things like this. You can define something. You can use pictures. You can use gestures. You can use all sorts of things. Um, to try and bring that input up to a level that the other person can understand the message. And when that message is being understood and being sort of negotiated, then suddenly it seems, um, by all accounts, that the language is starting to grow and build. Um, and so then, you know, come back and do that next week and you're going to find that you can do a little bit more. And before long, you're talking about things that you would just talk about normally. And I think it's really different, again, going back to the traditional way we talk about language learning with a textbook, pretty much everything you do in school is, I can talk about my holiday, I can talk about my hobbies, but I can I can say what my hobbies are. And I think this, was, this is one of the things um, with going through textbooks that I've just never connected with, is you're kind of forced to stick to a script of what you learn and what you say. Um, and I think going off script and really just being able to talk about our lives and topics that are of interest to us um, is such a such an exciting thing. And it's making it more relevant to your life. Um, and I think with a language like Yiddish, it's harder because um, if you're learning, I suppose, secular Yiddish, um, I'm not really going to run into people in my day to day life unless I make a real effort to go to these online spaces that I can speak Yiddish with. Um, so it's not like I can easily meet people like I could in France, um, or if I was learning German and went to Germany. Um, and it's, I just, I just found so much of language learning so boring <laughs> and it was just so, it was so separate to my everyday life. Um, and I know that that's something that you talk about a lot is making it interesting and relevant to you in your life and that if you were not doing it um if you're not going to do it in your day-to-day -day life you're not going to do it in a second language and yeah. I think um see I I read everything that you write I can I can just I can say it <laughs> um but you drunk the Kool-Aid <laughs> I've drunk the Kool-Aid but it's it's true um and uh, yeah I I in a way I almost feel cheated and frustrated that it took me this long to realize that there are other ways to learn a language. And I, I wonder if we should preface this at the beginning. Um, we should have prefaced this at the beginning with, um, I have been learning Yiddish for just under a year. Um, and I, I would not say that I'm fluent in Yiddish. I'm, this is not a video to say that in a year I became native-like and we can have a whole conversation about what does fluent mean. But I went from speaking, not being able to speak or understand Yiddish to being able to talk for hours in Yiddish and be able to engage with content for a significant period of time, does that mean that my grammar is correct? That is the last thing that is going to ever be correct for me. I will be making grammatical mistakes for a very long time. Do I know every word? No. Can I generally understand what's going on? Yes. And it's even the case when Sebastian is speaking to his mom in German, I can understand what they're talking about. That's I can't speak a word of German. I can understand generally what they're saying now. Um, sometimes it takes me a little bit longer to kind of be like, oh, that's like that word in Yiddish. Um, but one of the things that I noticed um, when we were talking about building that mental representation, especially in the early months, I would be kind of just sitting quietly and I could almost feel my brain filing something. Like it was really, really weird. It was like these words and these sentences were like popping into my head and it was almost like I could, is that actually a thing no, or am I imagining okay, so this? I could actually feel my brain like working it I out. I don't know what <laughs> exactly that is, but I felt the same way. And you know what's really, really interesting about all this? 
um, this is a sort of a strange story, but you mm. often know things that you don't know. Like your your mind is is creating these sort of entries in your memory, and you may not always be able to have access to them, but um, they they're there nevertheless. And I can think of an instance where what was the specific way in this in which this came up? I was reading um, uh, I was reading a book in Scots, and I. You know, Scots is relatively close to English, not mutually comprehensible, but, um, but you know, a lot. I had a dictionary in one hand, the book in the other, and I sort of worked my way through it. And I picked up a lot of words. That is a heritage language for me, so I have a lot of interest in learning it. And, um, you know, I went through the book, and then that was great, and moved on to other things. Um, Yiddish, actually, would be one of them. Then, months and months later, Someone said that they had a dream with this word, um, and this word was in Scots. And they asked me, what did this word... And they said, I think this word means this. And I said, no, 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 it means small or something like that. I don't remember what the word was in, in this instant. But I looked it up in the dictionary. It just, just the first thing that came to my head, I looked it up and it was correct. And it was not a word that you would find in English. Um, but the fact that I can't remember it now indicates just how contextual our ability to recall these things is you can have these memories that come out in a dream they come out in a conversation when it's just the first thing that comes to your uh to the tip of your tongue and then you can sit and think about it and you know not come up with it and so to make these things more accessible i think the process is one of just building and building and building and building and sort of convincing your mind that hey you know all these words that I put in you at some point, um, those are worth being able to dig up at a moment's notice and, and, and make those accessible. And, and I think that's also part of growing this, growing a language um, as well. I would say about 90 to 95% of my Yiddish learning has been conversations um, or in class, um, which is very conversation based, even though we did kind of go through some textbooks and we were reading things and discussing things where they came up when they were relevant. They were always within context. Um, but the thing that I found the most bizarre is I would say the majority of what I know in Yiddish, I don't remember learning. There's the odd word where I remember when I learned that word. Um, once it was talking about Beigels. Um, but the, um, the majority of the time I don't know how I know this stuff. There's a few things like that we've been kind of working on for me, especially around data, which is why I said I didn't want to talk about it. Like that's been kind of like, we've been working to kind of get that into my brain, but um, it has been really weird that kind of from one month to the next, I can kind of talk about more things or be able to know these other things when I haven't like explicitly sat down to study them and I think that has been the thing that I keep coming back to is like I don't feel like I've studied Yiddish I feel like I've acquired Yiddish um and for, that has been so nice for me it feels like I've spent a year talking to friends and having fun and at the end of that I have uh you know an intermediate let's say ability in Yiddish whatever this you know who cares about levels but if you want to put a pin on it you know, it's whatever level lets you have hour long conversations with your friends about stuff that you want to talk about. So that's and a great level to be at. Um, I'm but I think what's been really exciting is we've been able to. <sighs> Yiddish is hard in the sense that we don't have a huge amount of content for language learners, especially modern content for language learners. So it very much was limited to children's books at the beginning, which neither of us are particularly interested in um when we were able to advance to more um complex texts we um like we've just started going through a, a history book for high school students in Yiddish which is by like one of the most uh like this big deal Russian historian um and he has a textbook in Yiddish and I couldn't read it by myself um 
but we have some of these harder texts that we can do together with our teacher and with a dictionary and we can talk about the texts and they're in topics that are interesting to us and we are learning about art and history and culture from some resources that are available and we're getting to we're feeling more excited because we're able to now consume more of the content that we're interested in um, but we almost had to get to the level where we could do that because we don't have, for example, graded readers in Yiddish or a lot of the simpler texts. Like, I'm very interested in the shtetl. I've got a lot of books in English about the shtetl. I have a lot of interest in it historically. I don't just want to read basic things about children in the shtetl, right? Like, Yiddish is so much more than that. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, if I was learning German or if I was going to learn French now, because it was very different because it was a long time ago, you've got stuff like YouTube, you've got these really cool websites where you can watch all of these shows that have subtitles for language learners. You've got all of these resources and we just don't have that in Yiddish. There are some people making it. Um, we just need more. <laughs> yes. This is my plea. <laughs> yes. Well, it's, it's very hard to, because this content that's going to work for you is going to depend on your level and your interests. And ideally the, you know, the great Venn diagram of input would be comprehensible and compelling. If you can find yourself in the middle of that Venn diagram, you can find things that are both comprehensible and compelling, then you're great. You, you have no problem. You just go ahead and do it. Um, read it, watch it, listen to it, whatever it is. Uh, but if you are finding stuff that if you're, learning a language that is not spoken by a lot of people doesn't you know isn't the official language of any country doesn't have a big media you know doesn't have publishing a lot of publishing houses or tv producers or you know all these kinds of things it becomes just harder to find things that fit in that the middle of that venn diagram and so in that case i always try and tell people go for compelling over comprehensible because it's easier, it's easier to make things that are compelling, comprehensible, than it is to make things that are comprehensible, compelling. So this gets down to that, this gets to that idea of the children's books. You know, children's books are something that people always, not always, but people often recommend to learners. Read a kid's book. You know, this is what we did as kids, right? When we were acquiring our first language, you know, see, spot, run, this kind of thing. Um, the thing is, that might actually be compelling for a child, a young child. It is not compelling for someone, uh, you know, later on in the span of their life, you know, in their 30s, 40s, whatever. It's not interesting. You don't have any, you can't tell yourself, you can't convince yourself you have a legitimate interest in what's going to happen to Spot next. Um, and so with children's books, you also have this problem where, your learn you, the language that you're getting is kind of specific to children's books in a lot of ways. You know, look at all these, you, a lot of barnyard animals, a lot of you know giants and beanstalks and things like that. Um, which you know, if you're interested in folklore, that's great. You know, go off and do it. But if otherwise, that might not be that compelling to you. And so it's very hard to introduce stuff that you're interested in into those things because you don't know the language well enough to write. You know, to write input. You're not going to acquire the language from input that you was originally output from you. And also, you know, make that sentence work however you want. <laughs> and also, um, when you're learning a language like Yiddish, um, you know, I can't go and read about a modern topic that I would go and read about necessarily. Like, you know, we talk about integrating it into your day and, you know, like, um, I remember when I first wanted, oh, not even first, like a long time ago when I was very interested in learning French, I used to listen to slower news in French um, until I could watch the actual news in French. Um, and it was French news for language learners. And so it was something that I would do in that day. It was about topics that I kind of knew what they were about because I'd already read the news in English. So it gave me those context cues to be able to get language that is more relevant to my day-to-day -day life um and that was very motivating and i think with a language like yiddish again what's interesting um is so much content about yiddish so much content in yiddish now is about yiddish um with the post vernacularity um and 
what has been really exciting about having our conversation groups and the fact that Sebastian and I can speak Yiddish at home and um, that we now just have our general catch-ups in Yiddish together is that we are making it feel more real to us. It's not just in a classroom setting. We are using it as a living language. It's not a dead language, but we are. It, it has become more alive to us as a language because we are able to um, use it for things that aren't just talking about the language itself. <laughs> yes. And that's always, you know, again, unless you're one of these people like, like perhaps me, your, your interest in the language is not limited to, and not mine isn't either, but it's not limited to the language itself. It's, you have interest in a wide variety of things. You're interested in life, right? And you want that through the language, um, which can be challenging. Um, maybe I could, we could sort of wrap up this, this segment by giving people some, some ideas about how to, to implement these, uh, this kind of approach in their own language learning. So if you were starting a new language right now, um, say starting next week, what would be your first steps now that you've, you've gone through sort of one year of, of input based methods? How would you, how would you go about it? Find a teacher that you really like and that you would want to speak to, even if they weren't your teacher. Um, the great thing about online, uh, some of the online language, uh, website platform things is that they give you the opportunity to do trial lessons with people. So really take advantage of that and try and find someone that you would just want to hang out with anyway. Um, we can talk about this in the next section, but I would avoid the apps and avoid using and avoid what's the best way to put this language learning organization procrastination. It's like when you're at school and you're like, oh, I need to study for my exams, but you spend a whole day making a timetable and making these folders and doing all of this stuff. Um, and then you never actually get down to studying. Um, avoid spending too much money at the beginning. Like I bought a bunch of resources that actually were not appropriate for me. Um, and I would say take time to first really think about why you want to learn the language. Um, if you can find a buddy, that would be really great. Um, and just take time to really um, play around with it. Um, because I, and again, maybe this is something we can talk about a bit more. I'm a perfectionist and I found it really, really hard going into something that I'm not good at <laughs> and did not know how to do. And um, language learning is not just something you do for a few, I mean, you might if that's, if you want to learn for like a holiday. Um, but if you seriously want to learn a language, you need to give yourself time and permission to play around, change your mind, figure out what works for you um, and realize at the end of the day, you're doing it because you want to understand and better connect with a language and a culture and it should be fun. <laughs> um, I think so much online content makes language learning very serious um and if you tr again there are people like you that probably respond quite well to this if you treat it as something where you have to like actively study and um well, that's just not you you're not going to be successful so um have fun play around figure out what works for you it's good advice for life generally i think i think so I'll add what to, would you say? I'll yeah. add to this to say that I have a plan to recommend that you have a plan uh, for for what happens after the initial, the honeymoon phase. When you have this this sort of rosy feeling of progress which you, which you get at the start of any new venture, any new pr project, any new language, you're always going to feel this great thing at the start. Like, oh, I'm starting something new. And then... This is doubly so in language learning because your progress is so noticeable. Last week you didn't know any words. Now you know a hundred. It's like what this is. This is so amazing. I'm. I'm. If I keep going at this rate, I'll be fluent in six months. Um, that feeling will wear off pretty soon, and so know that that's going to happen. Be prepared for it, and see if you can have some input. Some maybe. It could be a short story, it could be a book, it could be a TV show, it could be a movie, whatever it is. Have that lined up 
and have it be your sort of, I'm intermediate now, present to yourself, to be able to work on this. And, and, and if you don't have that at that time, you can fall into a bit of a, this dreaded intermediate plateau when nothing seems to change week after week. You're just sort of hanging around, not really having that much fun with the language. You don't see the progress. You don't have this honeymoon period energy anymore. Um, I've found the only way to get around this is to have um, to have something to sort of a lily pad to hop onto, and and then once you start, you're actually consuming content that you really enjoy. Um, is it also helpful to be guided into what that content should be? Is for example, I got Harry Potter in Yiddish because it was translated into Yiddish. It's still too hard for me, partially because there's a lot of made up words. Yeah. to go along in this magical environment um so i would have thought by now i would be able to comfortably read harry potter and i've long since taken that out of my mind but i think having someone who can guide you from where you are in the progress that you're making and your interests that can say this is a um a reasonable little a intermediate reasonable present to yourself like. i think yes. that's extremely true it's so helpful to have a guide. This is the other thing I'd recommend. Get a teacher, like a really good teacher. And almost, you know, if you find a teacher that's really good and you'll know when you, you meet this person, just take any language that they teach because you We're will learn. That. <laughs> you know, I, I, I wish I could do that. Um, but uh, I'm doing that with Gustavo. <laughs> We, we, we gotta we gotta put Gustavo's links into the description because you know this is like a one hour long Gustavo ad so far. Um, uh, Gustavo Amos is our our teacher for for Yiddish, um, and he is he's a bench. Um, but if you can find a teacher, go through the process of learning a language for a year with them. You'll see what language learning can actually be, and you can take that into whatever other language you want to learn. Um, but yeah, the teacher is essential. No. Would you recommend a teacher over a class every time? Like a private uh, individual teacher? You know, it, or like a small group with people you know? or I mean, something. if you can, yes. It's not always feasible financially um, in terms of time, all of these things. But I would say that the individual lessons with a great teacher are the gold standard, individual or small group lessons. And, um, you know... The closer you can get to that, the the happier you'll be. Um, there's one thing I want to uh, answer from the comments uh, from the chat here, uh, which is um, Sebastian has asked if we have any good tips for finding comprehensible input for rare, less commonly spoken, yada, yada, yada languages. Um, yes. So there are a few things you can do. One thing that I always encounter this in terms of historical languages, because this, these are languages where people are not generally making any new content anymore. It's you have text and that's it. Um, and in that case, you have to, you have to sort of lower in some ways your expectations for how, um, just how gripping you will find the content. You may find it extremely compelling. You may not. You, you, but there are always going to be things that are better than others, things that are more interesting to you. One thing you can do is find commonly translated texts. Um, so, Natasha, you mentioned Harry Potter. That's one that has a lot of editions in, in a lot of languages, including minority languages um, and historical languages uh, in some cases. So there's a Yiddish Harry Potter. There's a Scots Harry Potter, um, for instance, two that I know. Uh, the other thing that you can do... so so. The, Sorry, I'll, I'll finish that thought first. That makes the content more comprehensible because you know what happens. You have this rich context. You know, if you've read the book in, in your first language already, you have that context. And so the you're going to be able to handle a more complicated, a, a less intrinsically comprehensible text, a text at a higher level because you have that context. Another way that you can do it is read something that you know a lot about. So if you are, you know, if you are a programmer if you can find a blog on programming in the language that you're learning then you're probably going to be able to consume more of that or at least uh stuff that's more intrinsically more complex because you you understand the domain that it's descri uh, describing already um and the third way and uh, is to just go over the same text over and over and over and over again so this is 
uh, an approach that I've taken with with uh, teaching Old English, which is to look at one text, say an extract from um, an excerpt from Beowulf, and read it over the first time and try and just get a few words. Then read it over a second time and try and get a bit more. Then read it over a third time and try and get a bit more. And understand that you're just going to approach this level of comprehensibility over time. That's not ideal, and it requires patience, and it requires you to have a text that you can stand reading over and over again. Um, but, you know, there are such things out there, and you probably have some things that you wouldn't mind consuming over and over again. Um, so that would be my advice there. I just said a lot of words, all, all, all in order. Wow. Um, shall we, shall we bring this segment to a close um, by telling, uh, telling our audience about this new project that we're working on? This is a fun thing. Do, do you want to do the honors, Natasha? Yes, I shall. Thank you. Um, we have decided to hashtag collaborate together on a brand new Substack newsletter that is specifically about language learning. And it is science-based tips, tricks, techniques for how to learn languages better. So a lot of the things that we were complaining about in the beginning with how um, most people are taught to learn languages. Um, it's all very well to complain about it, but what can we do about it? And um, we just wanted to have everything written down in a really accessible form for people. And it's from the perspective of someone like Colin, who is a language learner extraordinaire or very experienced language learner and a linguist. Um, and someone like me, who is not, um, who can help kind of ground everything um, for, let's say, the more average Joe in this situation um is one of the things that I've been thinking about a lot is that Colin you're not super relatable to me in, in, the, in the sense of um I cannot learn languages in the way that you do and I think a lot of people when they watch online content about language learning might feel very intimidated when they see I learned x language in three months or I speak 20 languages um Immediately you go on YouTube, language learning. First thing you see, polyglots. Yes. This is the, the, the difference is that chasm is too, too great. Um, I yes. Think. And that's exactly what we want to try and um, plug that chasm a little bit um, for people who are novice language learners, complete beginners, people who do not want to spend all day learning a language, who can't spend all day learning a language, who um, just want to be able to fit language learning into their lives in a way that is accessible and interesting and fun to them um, and want to get the most, well, how did we put it? Language learning bang for their buck. Exactly, exactly. Because there are- Do you need to add anything to our pitch? <laughs> no, I'll just say that, um, you know, we've been talking about these sorts of things today. And if you want it in a more, uh, sort of concise and sort of one-stop shop format. This newsletter is, is where to get it. And so it is called, how do you say dot, dot, dot. And um, it's available at how do you say dot stub, uh, substack .com. There will be a link in the description for that. Um, so please yes. subscribe, please subscribe. It's free. It comes out once a week. You know, what do you have to lose? And it will really walk you through how to start from the very beginning, understanding how we learn languages, why we learn languages, and how to even take a step back before you start learning a language to get you in the right place to do really well with your language learning and achieve the things that you want to achieve with it. So we're very excited about it and uh, we hope that you will join us. Excellent. Well, thank you, Natasha. We are going to take a quick break now and we're gonna come back and we're gonna talk about um, how to fit language learning into your life. Some practical, practical tips. Oh. 